the SCF Nuka model of care, so far, the theory is that we've understood that the basic product we're producing is a service industry model where relationship over time is our main product, not diagnosis, pills, and procedures. That we understand complexity science, how you're going to do this, is scale this at a whole system level, that we have to have this whole different backbone on which the platform of the whole thing is driven by the customer at both the micro and macro level, and that optimizing messy human relationships is the main thing we're doing. So, how did we do it structurally, specifically? Don is going to give you all the answers. So some of the improvements that we've done are um, optimizing um, our teams. And so we've created teams of providers uh, that, that are listed here, and I'll talk a little more in depth about um, our teams. So our integrated care team is made up of a primary care provider. About two-thirds of them are physicians, and the other third are nurse practitioners and PAs. There's a nurse case manager, case management support, certified medical assistant, a behavioralist, a dietitian, um, we've also, uh, on our team, started putting in pharmacists and nurse midwives. Um, and we also have coverage people uh, that are usually nurse practitioners or PAs for that team. Uh, we're looking at co-locating psychiatry. Uh, we also have coders, uh, data entry, and our front desk are also part of the team. So how does the team work? Each team has um, about 1,300 customer owners that are in panel to it. So when our customer owners want to be seen, they come and see this team. And so, so through time, they're going to get to know everybody on this team, and the team is going to get, the cust get to know the customer owner through time. So it's about building relate relationships longitudinally through time. Um, and that's the whole premise for this. So when somebody comes in with um, a need, um, they can access the system wherever they come into, and we have people who are, staff who are working at the top of their license um, to get people the care that they need. So if somebody just wants a medic medication refill, um, their labs are all fine, and maybe you know, they have hypertension, and they want their hypertensive medications, um, but their blood pressure is under control. Um, so they just call a case manager, and the case manager uh, will talk with a physician, and they'll, they'll sign off on that, and then they get their refills either mailed to them or they can pick them up, but they don't have to come in for a visit. Um, and if you look back at this model here, you know, the provider's in the center, and the provider actually looks like a bottleneck. And if you look at this model here um, that we, we operate under, the provider's down in the middle, and the provider acts more of an orchestra director. So the provider is integral to the whole system, involved in the whole system, um, but there's other ways of getting care that uh, people need. So some of the specific um, improvements that we've done, one is advanced access, and that's if somebody wants to be seen today, they get to be seen today. Um, and this, this is actually, to me, you know, everybody talks about advanced access all the time, um, what a great thing it is, and it is a great thing, but to me it's very culturally appropriate um, because where I used to work, where we didn't have this, I used to always tell everybody, we're always going to have walk-ins because it just fits with the culture. If somebody wants to be seen today and the time is right, that's when they're seen. It doesn't, doesn't you know, matter whether you have an appointment you know, three weeks away or whatever. If you want to be seen today, you're going to be seen today. Um, because you know, walk-ins were a problem there, but advanced access actually takes that away and it becomes um, uh, culturally appropriate for the population we're working with. We also have max packing, and what that means is when somebody comes in and is seen, um, they get everything done that they need right at that moment. Um, you don't you know, just fix one thing or deal with one thing and then have them rescheduled um, for the, the next problem on the list. We have service agreements with specialty groups. Um, we've redesigned a behavioral health um, uh, unit. I talked about the be behavioral health consultants that are part of the team. And so when, the, um, when a customer owner comes in and is seen by the team, they're actually you know, getting all their needs met at once. So if they have something um, that's going on where they need to talk a little longer, uh, the behavioral health consultant will actually come into the room and uh, the physician will do the handoff, and then the behavioral consultant, health consultant will actually spend time with that customer owner, and then the provider goes on to their next um, customer owner. Um, so we try to bring as much services as we can to our customer owners, and, we, and um, we don't expect them to be running all over the place to see uh, different people. We have um, hospitalists and pediatrics and internal medicine, and what that allows is that our providers can be dedicated 
to um, their panels and their customer owners and they don't have to worry uh, so much about the hospitalized care because we have the hospitalists in place. We also, as I said, we bring services to our customer owners and that includes like dietitian services, um, the pharmacists, the midwives, um, and we try to bring everything uh, to, to the room uh, where the person is. So customer ownership, um, what, what does that really mean? Um, and it, it means that at every aspect of um, our system, we have customer owners involved. Um, we want our workforce, workforce to be primarily Alaska Native, and we have about 60% of our workforce that is Alaska Native. Um, we want our uh, governance, so our board is all Alaska um, Native. We want our structural designs to um, reflect uh, the Alaska Native cultures. Um, and we want to um, evaluate success based on the customer perspective and values. And so everything that we do is integrated into our customer ownership. So we have changed the entire system, how you answer the phone, how you greet people, to how you organize and structure the physical building, to how you process people, to what you do on the phone and email and texting versus what you do in person. One of our goals is to drive down in-person visits as low as we can possibly get them. I know that's radical if you get paid for a visit. <laughs> One of the things we want to do is keep listening. I mentioned that we did six months of just listen, listen, listen before we launched the entire thing um, at all. And we want to keep perpetuating that because for us it's a commitment to have at least 10 ways in which the voice of the customer is being heard pretty much at all times in our organization. My job as a senior executive is completely different than it used to be. We used to see customer complaints as something to be managed and now comments from the customer are what drive and organize and inform our entire system. So we run focus groups a lot, we have comment cards, we do customer satisfaction surveys which I already mentioned, we have internet ways to communicate with us, we have a gathering where we advertise and everyone can come and tell us what they think. We have an elder council. We do in-depth, one-on-one interviews intermittently over time. So multiple, multiple, multiple ways in which we are a service organization responding to the customer's wants, needs, and wishes at all times. Anyway, this is the use of the ER in urgent care, and this just shows over a decade the huge decrease. Admissions to the hospital, huge decrease. Specialty visits, even bigger decrease. And then maintenance and slow improvement over time after the big change. Improvement in some uh, health quality outcomes and satisfaction ratings. And we're just showing you a little bit of data. We track 75 different indicators constantly, all the time, on the performance of our system. We do a ton on workforce development. If you're a service industry, then your product are your people and what they do in interaction and interchange with other people. That's your main product. If that's true, then where you need to put your money is in your workforce. And so we probably spend somewhere between five and ten times what most healthcare organizations spend on workforce development and training and advancement and reward and recognition, mentoring and all of that kind of stuff. Somewhere between five and ten times what most healthcare organizations do. We have job progressions and career ladders, we have individual performance development plans, we have a development center, we do this orientation and mentoring stuff we talked about. We have very different hiring practices. We do same day hiring and group hiring. We use behavioral based interview questions. Um, when, if you're in an entry level position, you spend up to a month in our training center before you ever get close to a phone or a front desk. And as a result, our staff turnover is one fifth the level it was 10 years ago. There's a ton to learn about measurement that most healthcare systems don't really understand. Data walls and data mall are extremely important. A very robust data mall is a hundred times more important than an electronic health record. If you don't understand that, then you don't understand what a data mall is and the power it has for improving and changing behaviors and driving a system over time. So that's a whole nother conversation. But extremely important just-in-time data in a relevant way that's usable by people to do their work with a mentoring and supporting and coaching system alongside it. And in the last two years, our clinical, our clinical measures have had a bigger jump in performance in the last two years than any of the other two-year increments if you look back in time. And we thought we were really, really good at driving improvement. But if you use data combined with mentoring in real time, coaching, built into the work environment, ways of doing things rather than after the fact reports and so forth, you get much, much further. 
So we cascade this across the system. Our vision, mission, key points and principles lead to four big corporate goals that don't really change across the decades. They lead to 17 corporate initiatives that change in a, somewhere between a one and three or four year horizon. These are the big, big dots we're trying to move. And these lead to division committee and department initiatives which have somewhere from three month to 18 month time frames. And every one of these things has a, a charter that defines who's doing what, roles and responsibilities and has measures and delivery dates and reporting requirements all attached to them so that we are running, like in the division I'm the VP of, which is about half the company, we're running 75 active projects at any given time supported by 20 full-time improvement staff, five or six of whom are experts, high-end experts, and about a dozen of whom are sort of lower-level program coordinators. But that's, again, about five times as much investment in improvement capability and infrastructure built into the system because even though we've done amazing things, we think we're only partway through transforming this thing called medical care into something that actually supports people on a health journey over time. So all that leads to annual plans by department and so forth and functional committee. And then every single employee, 1,400 people, have an individual performance development plan and performance action plan that connects strategically to all of these other projects. So everyone's evaluation is about two-thirds kind of their normal job and about one-third how they're contributing to the projects and the improvement work across the company. Disparities in cultural competency. I don't know about in Canada, but in the US these are big words, because 5% of the population drive 50% of the cost, and a lot of the cost, and complexities and poor outcomes are connected to people who aren't mainstream America. Gee, what a shock. So we have this whole disparities and so forth thing. The fundamental flaw in this whole conversation is that people think you're gonna fix this by putting a little veneer of culture over top of a fundamentally offensive and inappropriate medical system. So you teach people a little language, you have some interpreters, you put up some pictures, and you teach people whether to look in the eye or not look in the eye, or touch or not touch, and that's gonna fix all of our problems with disparities in cultural competency, right? It's usually the answer. It's a good thing, those are good things to do, but the problem is the system is fundamentally offensive to all human beings, and especially to people who are least in the mainstream of our um, uh, culture. So in order to be culturally competent, in our opinion, you have to put services into culture and quit trying to put a veneer of culture on top of services. So we've quadrupled the number of Alaska Native people employed in our system in the last 10 years. Words matter. Patient, the word patient is full of all kinds of baggage. We won't spend a lot of time on this. Compliance and non-compliance, anything pisses me off more than those two words, I don't know what it is. The issue of calling patients compliant or non-compliant is paternalistic, judgmental, offensive, demeaning, shame, harassment, guilt. None of those things really work to change behaviors. If you buy that first diagram I put up where the customer is in control, then they need to be in control and we need to quit judging them compliant or non-compliant with our all-knowing medical wisdom. And instead, the words ought to be applied to whether we're compliant or not with their want, needs and wishes on their health journey. We need to quit using guilt, shame, and harassment as our usual motivators. Case management, the US CMS paid for these big case managers, nurses on the phone, never met them before, and personal people calling up, guilting, shaming, and harassing you about your non-compliance. It didn't work, and the CMS scuttled it after five years of trying. But 3% of the, of the firms doing that work did succeed. The difference is they built personal relationship over time and partnership with people, and they succeeded. The case management worked. So just to summarize, here's some of the things we've said. Relationships, trusting personal partnerships longitudinally over time are what matter. Being customer driven based on the values of the people receiving services. Same day access, max packing, working at the top of your license, service agreements between departments, job progressions, career ladders, mentoring, giving story, receiving story, accountable performance, putting services into culture instead of culture into services. Asset based positive approaches permeating the entire thing and running the same thing obsessively on operational principles. Every decision made in SCF pretty much is made on how well it aligns with our operational principles. Good alignment, we're gonna do it. Bad alignment, we're not gonna do it. So here's a summary statement. Primary care must change. It's the most failed part of the medical system. And I'm tired of hearing primary care people complain about being victims. Woe is us, we don't have status, we don't have privilege, we're paid terribly. Everyone dumps on us, everyone blames us. Woe is us, woe is us, we're the victims. The customer has no power and control in changing healthcare. The government and other payers want to buy a good product and we provided them a crappy product. Are their colleagues in healthcare just looking out for their own turf? 
If the system's gonna change, the people who run the longitudinal platform called primary care have to change the longitudinal platform called primary care. It's up to us in primary care to change it. And playing the victim and blaming other people hasn't worked for 20 years, and it just makes us look stupid. Remember, the patients are in control. We're a service industry. It's longitudinal relationship over time, and the patient should decide what success looks like. And at the end of the day, this is what they should be able to say. They give me what I and my team have defined, what I need, when, where, and how I want and need it in a safe, effective, and optimized way. They really know me and care about me. They listen to me, advise me, support me on my journey and my entire health journey. My questions and concerns are answered. My care is coordinated. My values and goals are what drive my health plans. And if the people in your system can say, give you a 10 on all of these things, then you've succeeded in designing a system that works. This isn't simple. This isn't one little change or two little changes. This is changing everything in an entire healthcare system. And that's extremely hard work that takes a long time.